Good morning and good morning again, and welcome to the LA County Master Gardener Gardener Place Workshops. We have lots of interesting things for you this morning, but we're going to start off with a, uh, a group favorite. It's time for some more true confessions of a master gardener. And in this case, we're going to ask Judy Gomez to step in and, and do some dirt. <laughs> He's giving hints away as to what we're going to talk about today. I'm Judy, and uh, welcome to episode five of True Confessions of a New Master Gardener. Some of you are new, I believe, to this um, illustrious group of every other Tuesday morning or first and third Tuesday morning. Some of you are repeat customers. So I am actually um, a brand new Master Gardener in the class of 2020, and I just graduated in May and really learned a lot, but really found out I had an awful lot to learn. So, um, today I'm going to follow up to a last episode where we did some soil testing at the Monrovia Community Garden because I know you're all anxiously awaiting uh, what those results are. So again, in review, um, I did this soil testing as a member of the Monrovia Community Garden leadership team. This is my little disclaimer that this was not really part of my master gardener work, but it was part of my community garden work. So the um, the Monrovia Community Garden, again, this is a review, was actually um, started just two years ago, and this is on the grounds of a church that was built in 1947. And so we were concerned about lead, and so we decided to get a formal uh, soil test because we are in partnership with the city and they asked that we do this. So you can see that there are nice boxes in front, Those, that's all new soil, but up against the church right back here we were planting in ground and we just wanted to see what we were what we were up to again we were concerned about lead so we chose uh, university of massachusetts umass because this is a very um for the, our soil test because it's relatively inexpensive it's only 20 dollars for a very complete soil test and some of these places are very very expensive so we chose this one and uh, I sent in the $20 and I sent the sample in on July 20th, which was a couple weeks ago. And the results came back on August 5th, which I thought was pretty good. And I saw all of you guys here and did a presentation on August 4th. And guess what? The results came back the very next day. So we um, followed all the instructions and I'm not going to review what we did, but if you want to watch the recording from two weeks ago, you can see what we did exactly to collect the sample. But we ended up doing exactly what they told us to do and sent in one cup of soil um, in a Ziploc bag and then I waited for their email. So actually, my true confession for the week is I didn't really understand very much when I was reading the soil testing results. And I took inorganic and organic chem chemistry a long time ago. And so I had to do some, um, some research on what I was looking at. So this is what it looked like. These were our results from UMass. Again, this was $20. It was a very comprehensive report. You can call them, you can email them and ask them what things mean. This is coming from Massachusetts. It's not coming from Southern California. So that I had a few questions and I happen to have a very close friend who is not only a master gardener and a California naturalist, he also happens to be a soil scientist. So I was very lucky. Everybody needs a BFF soil scientist in their life because he really helped me on what I needed to figure out here. So this shows micronutrients, macronutrients, it shows the soil pH. And again, I had to look up a lot of stuff. So this is a complicated slide, but I'll try to keep it very simple. First thing they told us is the pH, our acidity and alkaline was 7.2. That's a little high for us. So you'll see we're gonna do something about that. Our lead value was 9.5. Actually, the optimum range is just less than 22. So we're really good on the lead. That was a surprise to us. If there was lead paint years ago, it, it's not showing up in the soil if there was lead paint on the side of the church. So uh, we are going to just still be careful and not plant any leafy greens or any root vegetables, but uh, we're really happy with those lead results. So then if you look at that little bar graph there, you see the phosphorus was like explodingly high. 
I believe, let me see if I can find it here. Our exact value was 55 and the range they're looking for is between four and 14. So we were really high in phosphorus. We were really um, optimum in potassium and potassium is K, it's, it's the, the, um, the symbol for potassium. Calcium was high, as you can see by the third line right here, and magnesium was high. And my red arrow here shows that what they decided to um, put down at the bottom of our chart, chart is that phosphorus is excessive. So um, if we deal with the high phosphorus levels, here's where the research and the soil scientists came in. If we deal with those high phosphorus levels, many of the other issues are going to be solved. Again, there was normal potassium, high calcium, if we lower the pH and correct phosphorus, that's going to help. I have another slide that really shows what we're going to do. And the magnesium is connected to the calcium. So there is this this wonderful, um, everything is interconnected in soil. I didn't really realize that, again, my true confession. In the micronutrients, boron was high, manganese was high, zinc was high, and iron was low. Again, fascinating to me. We did find out that this area used to be a lawn, and they were probably just using some regular fertilizer for years and years and years, some sort of inorganic fertilizer that was high in the second number, which is phosphorus. So why is elevated phosphorus even a problem? So I got a quote here, the buildup of phosphorus can cause plants to grow poorly and even die. The excessive phosphorus reduces the plant's ability to take up the required new micronutrients, particularly iron and zinc. Remember we were low in iron, but we were high in zinc. So again, the interconnectedness of soil. So I went down yesterday and took a picture of these lovely watermelon plants that we planted right out front. We did get three watermelons, but it's a community garden and it's public, so we don't know who took the watermelons or what they tasted like. I wish I could track down those people, but that's what our garden is for. It's for people taking uh, the fruit as it ripens. But this is a really good example of the watermelon leaves reflecting soil toxicities and deficiencies. Um, again, remember iron was low, zinc was high. The excess phosphorus looks very similar to low iron with more tip and edge burning. And I don't know if you can see that, but there's a lot of burning on the sides of this, uh, of this watermelon here. So it looks like this watermelon is having a problem with zinc toxicity and low iron and excess phosphorus. It doesn't allow the plants to do what they need to do. So guess where we go? We go to UCANR, like we've talked about many times, and they have a wonderful 14-page article on remediation and best management practices of soil. This is excellent. It's an excellent article. So. What we're considering, we're not adding anything that contains phosphorus. It's gonna take four to six years for us to get that overabundance of phosphorus out of this soil. We're thinking about growing crimson clover to add nitrogen and absorb phosphorus. That would be over fall and winter in that area along the church wall. We plan to reduce the soil pH by adding peat moss. This will help with the calcium, magnesium, manganese, zinc, and iron. I know I'm going quickly. I have other people who need to make presentations today. We're going to add some iron and we're going to add nitrogen using bone meal, doesn't contain phosphorus, and this is going to help with some of these micronutrients. So this was a very heavy presentation. I learned so much, so I'm going to end with a haiku. The moral of the soil story in haiku, and remember haiku are five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. Your soil could be fine or it could be unhealthy. Test it to find out. Stay tuned for episode six in two weeks, folks. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, that was both really heavy and really um, um, helpful and useful because one of the things we forget is when we're buying over-the-counter um, fertilizer, it comes with a little bit of everything. And some fertilizers have more of some things, but most of it has a little bit of everything. And you can buy just N products. You can buy just P products. You can buy just K products. And, and if you had a lawn that was heavily fertilized, 
it may be already pretty uh, pretty over fertilized. That's pretty wild. Very cool. Um, again, the uh, the testing lab was University of Massachusetts at Amherst, but there are labs in Southern California, and they range from a um, a, a few tens of dollars to hundreds of dollars, depending on what sort of uh, uh, piece you, you put in. I had a real quick question though for you, Judy. I know they ask you what you're going to use the soil for when they test it. What did you tell them? Oh, that's a really good question. And I know you can't see this, but we actually, this is all the six pages because we said we might use grapes and we might use blueberries in that area. And they recommended neither of those. The way our soil is right now, they recommended no grapes and no blueberries. But Excellent. we didn't have to tell them exactly what we wanted to plant there. Right. Well, they give you the option to suggest, I'm about to, uh, because they're really farm oriented, I'm going to have a farm of grapes. And they say, e maybe not. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. And although one of the other pieces we keep an eye on is that because they're back east and they're in a completely different ecosystem than we are out west, um, we look at their recommendations for amendment and take them with a grain of California salt uh, to modify them for our weather. They get a lot more rain back in New England and it does a lot more leaching of micronutrients from the soil. So sometimes the additions need to be uh, adjusted. And if that's you why you need to have a friend, that's a soil <laughs> scientist. And he sends me this big long email. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you one of the questions that has come up is that uh, somebody wants you to rat your soil scientist friend out <laughs> and, and I said, well, how about we put the questions on the Master Gardener uh, Facebook page and we'll see if we can get them um, to do a guest stint. Um, but in any case, uh, people are interested. Uh, the other piece is if you're doing California natives, uh, some of the things that are terrible for growing food are excellent for growing California native plants, whether you're using them for uh, ornamentals or for um, other, uh, other processes. All right. Well, uh, speaking of food, um, it, it, it's time for, for one of my favorite categories of food. We have a master gardener, Jessica Yarger, is going to talk to us about uh, brassica. Brassica Jessica is coming right up. I've, I've said that so many times, she'll be glad when she's done so she doesn't have to hear it again. But <laughs> go ahead. All right. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Yarger. I'm a master gardener, um, class of 2017. And I'm talking to you today about brassicas. And we consider these a cool season crop. We kind of, I associate them with, you know, the winter months, that's when we're usually harvesting them. So it, it might seem odd that we're bringing them up now in the middle of this historic heat wave that we're having. Um, and I am because now is a great time to start your brassica seeds. And I'm gonna to get to that in just a minute. And before I do that, I'm gonna just give you a little background, a little history, because it is a really fascinating group of plants um, that have been in cultivation for a very, very long time. Um, and they're all related to each other. Um, they're all the brassica, I'm gonna pull up a slide here in just a second. Um, but the brassica plants that we think about generally are broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, um, kohlrabi is in there, and there's many others I think I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, and they all, I'm going to share my screen now, uh, come from, there we go, they're all um, the same species that has been uh, cultivated over time um, to uh, kind of highlight certain traits of the original wild brassica. Uh, and over here on this slide, just quickly, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, the species name is Oleraceae. And you'll see, um, if, if you're, especially if you're purchasing seeds, often it'll, it'll um, also name the subspecies. So for example, if you look at this whole list of what we include in our brassica slash like what we also call coal crop family, um, you'll see Brassica oleracea, and then you'll see this um, subspecies name. So for example, collards and kale are different. You'll see the subspecies for cabbage uh, is different from, from those. And this is just the emphasis uh, or name sort of the breeding, the, the selection that happened. And now we have all these subspecies of the same species. But what this means just botanically is that all of these plants, so kale, 
and cabbage and Chinese broccoli, cauliflower, all of these can pollinate each other. Um, so they can, so a collard could bloom and bees could come around and fly around, pick up the pollen and pollinate a cabbage. Um, and then, and so they're not, they're not, um, it doesn't, so like kale doesn't just pollinate kale. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it's a fascinating plant. Um, when we look, I'm gonna, my next slide is about the, the history of it. Um, and so we're actually eating, it's like, it's sort of like the same plant, <laughs> whether you're eating kale or kohlrabi, botanically speaking, um, or kohlrabi, we're just eating or emphasizing a different part of the plant. So um, it all, they all come from a wild cabbage. Uh, it's a Mediterranean, it's found in the Mediterranean, coastal Mediterranean area. Um, the wild cabbage, the wild brassica that all of these plants are derived from um, is a biennial, so meaning that it has a two-year uh, life cycle. It'll bloom in the second year and then die out. Uh, and they and they believe, uh, historians believe that this plant was domesticated back in the 14th century. And probably kale and collards came first. And it was done by farmers cultivating and, and selecting, artificially selecting for certain traits in the plant. So for example, for kale and collards, they took the wild cabbage and started selecting for um, bigger, leafier leaves. And so choosing those plants that they were having to then breed and, and then you know, keep selecting until we got kale and collards and then all the varieties of those that we have. Um, for example, cabbage um, that we're selecting for the terminal bud, so the one at the top. Brussels sprouts, if you've ever seen them grow, they have um, their little buds all up along the stem, so the lateral uh, buds. Uh, kohlrabi is a, just an inflated stem, so that was the plants were selected for uh, the stem growth, and they believe that kohlrabi was, was sort of uh, selected and artificially bred in Germany. Uh, and then broccoli and cauliflower were eating the flowers or the buds of the flowers. I'm going to go back to the other slide because it's, it's interesting uh, because the, uh, the botanical name, so for example, kale uh, and the botanical, the subspecies name, uh, Ocephala, actually means without a head. And in contrast, Capitata for cabbage means having a head. So that you, you can see sort of where the, the naming comes from and also it is um, describing sort of, sort of how the plant was, uh, what, what should I say, manipulated <laughs> to uh, produce certain traits that uh, we found desirable for eating. Uh, so really when we're eating the wide range of the brassica family, the coal crops, we're eating all different parts of the plants, almost everything um, above ground. Um, are, they, they were cultivated so that we could be eating leaves or stems or the flowers. So it's really um, a fascinating group of plants. Um, they also are quite nutrient dense too, if I didn't mention that before. Um, so we know that like kale, especially recently has gotten very popular because of the nutrients that it does have, but the others as well, the cabbages and broccoli, all of that is very nutrient dense. Um, now, summer is not typically a time that we're growing brassicas. Um, they're very susceptible to the heat. Um, they'll, it'll force them to, uh, to bolt. And uh, also I find when I try to grow, especially kale, because sometimes that'll kind of go you know, through the summer, it is much more susceptible to aphids and, and other pests um, in the warmer season, just because it's, you know, it's weakening um, as it's growing through the heat. But now in August, um, in early September, is a great time to start uh, brassica seeds. Um, that way you'll have nice uh, sized seedlings to transplant into the soil or into the ground once it cools down a little bit in October. And just like most seeds, so I started mine about a week ago, maybe a little more, and I already have most of them germinated. Um, I put them in uh, pots, small, I just use the six packs, but whatever you have would work. 
Um, I sow the seeds about a half inch down in the soil, all the brassicas, and then keep, it's really important um, to keep them moist. Now on a date like these last few days we've been having, I'm having to check on them, you know, a couple times a day just to make sure that they're not drying out. The humidity has helped with that, that they're not drying out instantly. But then also very importantly, it's important that they're not in the sun in the afternoon. Um, so I have them in a spot in my yard where they're getting some sun in the morning, but by midday or early afternoon they're in um, shade. They can stand partial shade, but for me right now, they're because of this heat, they're in very um, you know dark, deep shade. Uh, so just to protect them because they're all, they're vulnerable to the the heat, especially when they're quite young. Uh, once they put on their true leaves, I have found that the cabbage moths find them right away. <laughs> um, so those are those little white butterflies you know you see coming through your garden, um, and they will land on those leaves and and uh, lay their eggs on the underside usually, um, and then the caterpillars will hatch and they will eat your seedlings in a day. <laughs> Especially when they're very small, there's not a lot of foliage there, so those caterpillars will will eat them quite fast. Um, so it can be cumbersome to be checking on. Uh, your, your seedlings for eggs or caterpillars every day. So you can, so I sometimes will just flip all the leaves over and look, you can see the little white eggs attached to the leaves and you, you can just brush them off. Um, or you may find a caterpillar. They're very, very hard to see when they're tiny because they're exactly the same color as the leaves. Um, or which I'm trying this year is I have row cover. Um, that So once the, the seedlings have sprouted, and have true leaves, I will gently just put some row cover over them so they still get sunlight, um, but the moths won't be able to land on them to, to um, lay their eggs. Um, and then in, I will just keep them in partial shade until it starts to cool down a little bit. And then I'll, just like as you would if you were starting seeds inside and then moving them outside, I will slowly put them into more and more sunlight in the afternoon. And then by October, maybe later October, we'll see how our fall goes. Um, they should be ready and it should be cool enough for them to transplant successfully into the ground. So if you're at a nursery now and you're seeing coal crops you know, as seedlings, I would not recommend buying a seedling now and for transplanting now in August or September, but you certainly could get a start uh, with sowing your, your seeds right now. And that's it. I mean, that's it. Let's just, you just got to put them in the ground and get started and, and wait. We, Jessica, we have quite a few questions that oh. have come up. So I'm going to throw a couple at you and other master gardeners, if you want to throw those out, that'd be great. Um, I think you answered one of the questions already. There was, what do we do with it in this heat wave? And I think your answer would be wait <laughs> um, or plant them so they stay cool. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I wouldn't go out, run out and plant anything during the, this 100 degree heat. Um, I think it's pretty tough on almost anything. Or if you're even doing starting seeds, you just have to be super di diligent about keeping that soil moist, which becomes harder, you know, when it's the temperatures are rising. Right. Well, and then there are two pieces to the, the brassica story. They, they don't mind wet conditions because most of them are waxy and repel the water. Mm -hmm. And they, um, in fact, need a reasonable amount of water to grow. Uh, so fall and winter is better for them. And uh, they dislike the heat, or rather the heat drives them to bolt and go to seed. Yes. So it's the heat, not the light, that's the, the problem for these guys, mm -hmm. as opposed to some yeah. other plants. Cool. Um, somebody did say they put some um, some starts in last September and they just kind of sat there and didn't do much until April or May and when suddenly uh, they started to to grow. Uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts about that? Have you seen anything like that? Can you repeat the question? I didn't quite understand it. Yeah, if, um, if I read it correctly, they basically said they planted their uh, starts from the nursery in September and didn't see any real growth all winter long until as late as April or May. For a brassica? Um, yes, I believe it was cabbage. Huh. Um, 
I, you know, sometimes I think, and, and this is just a, a guess, you know, is that if we're off on our timing, the shock on the, on the, when we transplant could slow down growth. I don't know why they wouldn't. So you, it's a tricky thing with the, with the fall winter garden, because things will really slow down and, and, you know, in our coolest months. And so it's, the, it's getting the timing so that you kind of get a little bit of, you know, you get the growth going. So, I mean, September, it depends on what the plant is, but, you well, know, and then it slows down and then it'll pick back up in the spring. I mean, that's certainly true. Yeah. So the commentator uh, put in that it was uh, uh, something called sprouting broccoli. Um, so it was a broccoli. Um, but they all are, are similar and, and it's, uh, you're right. That's something to keep uh, in mind that we see really fast growth in the spring mm -hmm. and we see really heavy growth in plants over the summer, but those overwintering crops tend to grow slower because they're just not as warm and it's not as uh, sunny. Yeah. Uh, they grow just fine, but they grow more deliberately perhaps is a way to put it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, does anybody else have a question they were able to pull out of the chat? Yeah, I see, uh, Jessica, somebody wanted to know if uh, what that you feel about keeping seedlings indoors on a sunny windowsill and sort of separately, did you use uh, seed starter soil? <laughs> um, I laugh at myself because I, um, I'm always thinking, oh, I should have different soil for starting my seeds. But honestly, I just use whatever I have around um, in a bag, uh, usually something left over that I was, you know, amending in the garden. And I don't, I mean, it doesn't seem to, I still have, you know, my seeds are germinating. Um, I, yeah, I just don't tend to buy seed starting product or, or make it. I just tend to use what's around. So no, I don't use a seed starting soil, <laughs> um, but I do use a bag soil. I want to make sure it's a light soil and not too heavy. Um, my soil, my, my uh, soil, just my native soil here is pretty sandy. Um, so I use something with a lot more organic matter in it um, just to hold moisture better. Um, and then the other one was about windowsill. Yeah. Do you, Can you keep the seedlings indoors on a sunny windowsill? Yeah, you definitely could. Um, it, it would be a much more controlled environment. Um, but then again, just like as if it, you would have to um, get them used to being outside. So that might mean when you're ready, before you're ready to transplant, you know, maybe a week or two before you start taking them out, you know, and then bringing them in. And it might be the opposite that you're kind of putting them out in the cooler parts of the day and bringing them in for the warmer parts of the day, where in the spring, it's sort of the reverse, where we're putting them out when it's warmer and, and when it's cooler. Um, and just to get them um, acclimated to being outside and then the shock into the ground won't be as dramatic. Um, but I don't see why you couldn't, um, yeah. I saw something about bok choy and greens like mash. When do I start Asian greens? I started bok choy um, last week. So bok choy is a different is a different species. It's part of a brassica family, but it's um, not the Oleracea. Um, and they, t in my experience, bok choy is a lot easier to bolt than and mash probably too. I haven't actually grown it, but. Um, I find bok choy is one of the first things in my garden to go to flower. Um, so I'm, I planted it and, it, and I may be sorry because <laughs> if it gets big enough and then it's still, we have a long, warm fall, it may bolt before it even really does anything. So uh, I would almost say you could try now, but no, you might have to replant again when it cools down just a bit, just because I think it's more... It's, it just goes to seed a lot quicker than like a cabbage or a broccoli. And, and that's one of those interesting things is those leafy greens were always eating babies and you can't let them become uh, hit, hit puberty. Otherwise they are all bitter, just like adults and humans yeah. are. Um, the broccoli question has come back and it was something called sprouting English uh, broccoli, uh, English violet broccoli. And I went and found it online and I read about it. And it says it's a slow grower over the winter and will come up with sprouts that look like broccoli rod because they're very loose that are purple in the spring. So that plant did exactly what it was intended to do. It's intended to be grown by people in England where they do not have our lovely Southern California Mediterranean winter and um, grow slowly and survive and be one of the first vegetables available in the spring. 
So in that case, it actually did what it was supposed to. There was also one other quick question um, about compost, but it's actually about uh, broccoli or, or cabbage leaves or some such. Covered in aphids, they want to know, do we throw them in the compost bin or do I need to do something else with them? And I'm sure we all have our answer, but we're, we're talking broccoli and then we're going to move on. Oh, like if you have a, uh, I would just throw it in a compost bin. Those aphids won't, I, it's not a, a, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone who knows more about compost, but I don't see them proliferate in the compost. Right. Um, they tend to proliferate on the leafy greens. And once those are gone, they don't have anything to eat um, because they just, they suck the little juice out of the, the leafy green. If you have chickens, that would be a really great thing to give to your chickens. <laughs> I, we used to do that at the school garden. I, I uh, worked out if we had a really aphid infested a cabbage or whatever, we would give it to the chickens. Yep, I think you're right. I think if those aphids are on a green leaf that is no longer attached to a plant, it's no longer juicy and there's nothing to, uh, to vampire out of it. Because uh, aphids are true, true bugs, they're they sap suckers. Cool. All right. Well, I'm, I just I love Brassica. I have a four page essay about the etymological origins of the whole thing. And, you know, people do it all the time, but we and we don't notice, but we call them coal crops. And coal comes from a root word call, which is also seen in the word cauliflower, which is one of these crops. But the weird thing is you already knew they were called coal crops, even if you didn't realize it. Sure, you've had coleslaw. Oh, Shredded cabbage is coleslaw. And there's all kinds of very weird little weird uh, word tricks that come up that show the history of some of these food products that we eat. Speaking of the history of food products, we have a presentation coming up next on an ancient food product. One that gets mentioned in early texts and has been around in, in the world for a long time and Southern California for a pretty long time as well. Um, Jeff, are you ready for us? I, <clears throat> yes, I am. We would like to hear from you about figs. Well, terrific. Okay. Well, I'm Jeff Warner. I'm also a uh, class of 2017 master gardener like Jessica. And August is the start of our fresh fig season. So I thought this would be a good time to uh, talk about figs. Uh, so most of us probably got our introduction to figs with the, uh, the Fig Newton, uh, which is made from dried figs that are ground into a paste. And, uh, and it's, uh, you can make your own. There's a little link there to the recipe and I'll provide the, uh, the PDF at the end of this. So you can, uh, you can you know, just go to the link. But uh, fresh figs are really a whole other thing. They're, if you haven't had a fresh fig, you really have to try them, especially one that's grown at home where they're picked uh, at full ripeness. You can get them in the market this time of year, uh, but they're typically picked a little too young. And just a day or two difference is, is tremendous with figs. They, you know, two days too early and they're not very sweet uh, and, they're, and they're a little bit dry. And then if you just wait a couple more days, they soften up. Uh, they get a lot juicier and much, much sweeter. So it's, uh, they're definitely worth, uh, worth growing for that reason. So there's a long history of figs. It's, uh, it's one of the earliest cultivated plants, originally from Western Asia. It's, uh, let me see there. Uh, it's, of course, it has uh, biblical connections. There's some 50 uh, references in the Bible to figs including uh, Adam and Eve who are said to have used figs to hide their shame after uh, eating the forbidden fruit. Uh, this is, that picture there is interestingly uh, from a fertilizer advertisement, uh, which I like that connection. And, uh, and so figs go way back at least to 5,000 BC. They found remnants of figs in excavations dating that old. Uh, California started, it's been, we've had figs here for about 250 years now, starting with the uh, the first figs planted at the San Diego Mission in 1769. Today, California is one of the you know, biggest producers commercially. Only, you know, only, uh, only Turkey produces more commercial figs than we do. And California in particular produces almost all of the domestically grown figs. So my personal connection to figs started in about 2016 when I bought uh, two different uh, fig trees from nurseries. Uh, this is the uh, panache. This is still my favorite fig. I got to try this when I visited a uh, California rare fruit grower up in, uh, up in the Sequoia area. 
And he had one, he had a really big version of this tree. And it's just a very nice balance of sweet and you know, not too sweet, really fresh, really great fresh hitting fig. And my plant uh, is growing pretty slowly. This is, this is not a plant that's dwarf normally, but I think because of my soil conditions, it's just been growing very, very slowly. Cause this plant's only maybe about eight feet tall at the high point. Uh, and this is a plant that can easily grow to maybe 25 feet if it's left unpruned. So this is one of the varieties that has a, uh, well, I'll tell you in a minute about the two different kinds of crops that you can get from figs. So, oops, I think I skipped one. Yeah, here we go. So my second one is another variety from France called Violette de Bordeaux. And it's even sweeter, um, it's, it, but it's a true dwarf tree. It, it doesn't get taller than about eight to 10 feet naturally. So this is a really good choice for uh, container growing if you can't, uh, if you don't have a spot in your yard. And this particular uh, fig we got through mail order and it came in about a one gallon tall skinny pot, uh, just a little whip. It had no branches on it. It just had some leaves at the top. And, uh, you know, it's, and, and now you can see what it looks like today. Uh, and it's got a really an excellent, very, very sweet fig. So fig trees can be quite big, 10 to 30 feet tall, and they're typically even wider than they are tall. Uh, the branches like avocados and citrus, they have a thin bark, and so they are susceptible to sun scald. So uh, especially with young trees or the trees that don't have a full canopy, you wanna use uh, a, a whitewash to protect the branches. And that's just a 50-50 mixture of uh, interior white latex paint with water. Uh, and just, you know, just apply that to the, any branches that are exposed to the sun. And daylight today would be really important to make sure that it wasn't happening. Uh, the roots are invasive like all uh, other figs in this family. Uh, and, and the, root, you know, the roots travel way far from the canopy. And it also contains latex, uh, so that can be really irritating to skin. So anytime you, you know, cut a branch, break off a leaf, or pull off a piece of fruit, you get a little bit of this white milky latex uh, that comes out. That actually helps the plant heal, but it, it is irritating. Uh, and so it, it comes from, from the fact that, you know, figs are, uh, the, fig, the edible fig is also related to the rubber tree. It's also a type of ficus. So it has a completely unique type of fruit. This is really what makes it stand out to me is that, you know, the, you never see flowers on a fig per se, uh, but somehow we have fruit. And it's because the flowers are actually on the inside of what develops into the fruit. It's a special structure called a syconium. And uh, the outer layer, the, you know, the skin plus that flesh on the outside is actually part of a stem called a receptacle. And it's usually receptacles are right at the base of a flower. But in this case, it's, it's created this cavity. And inside this cavity are you know, hundreds of tiny flowers. And uh, the uh, the, uh, they, they call this an accessory fruit because, uh, because of the fact that most of what we eat is not derived from the ovary, it's derived from the stem tissue. And they also call it a multiple fruit because it's a collection of flowers that have individually merged together to create a single fruit. So it's really interesting that way. And, uh, but, so there are four basic types of edible figs. They're all ficus carica. Uh, the one we, we grow at home is called the common fig, and there's hundreds of varieties of these. And uh, this, is a, this is one where the flowers inside the fruit are just female, and they don't require pollination. And so they, we do have little seeds inside of each of our edible figs, but they're actually hollow and they're not viable. You can't really plant them. And this is a, a thing called parthenocarpy that uh, certain fruit trees do. And so it makes it really easy to grow a fig. You don't need any kind of a pollinator nearby. Some fruit trees, you have to have another similar tree to cross pollinate. Other trees will have to be self pollinated. These don't need any kind of pollination. So it's very quick, you know, it's very easy to grow them uh, and get a successful crop each year. There's also one called a Smyrna fig, which is grown uh, commercially. It's one of the biggest, uh, one of the largest crops in California. And this one actually has also just female flowers inside, but they have to be pollinated. And the pollination is done by a special uh, pollinator called a fig wasp. And uh, it needs another type of fig to provide the pollen because the Smyrna figs are all female. The plants are all female, the ones we're reproducing anyway. And so they, they use a capper fig for the, uh, the pollen source. So this is more complicated to grow. The timing is really important. Uh, but Smyrna figs are really popular as a dried fig. And it's because the seeds contain an oil that gives the, uh, the fig a nutty flavor. 
And then the last type is the San Pedro fig, which is kind of a, co a combination of a common fig and a Smyrna fig. It, it produces a crop at the beginning of the season, an early summer crop that doesn't need any pollination. Then it produces a second crop that does require pollination. So the Smyrna's, the Capra figs, the San Pedro figs, you're not gonna find those in nurseries. That's a special thing you'd have to order. So this is just showing you what happens. You know, this is a commercial orchard where they're growing uh, these Smyrna figs and the, uh, to, uh, they have to bring in the pollen and the wasps. And so what they do is they hang you know, these paper bags from the trees and inside the bag is a few of the capper figs with the wasps. You can see the, uh, <coughs> got a bug in my mouth, good timing. <coughs> and uh, the, uh, the, the, the capper fig itself, it looks like a fig, but it's dry inside and inedible. And you can see on the picture of all those little tiny things that may look like ants are actually little wasps. And it's, it's an interesting thing. These wasps depend on this, on this particular plant to reproduce. Uh, and, 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 uh, and they go, after they hatch out of the capper fig, they're looking for other figs to go and, uh, and lay their eggs in. And they can't tell the difference between a capper fig and a Smyrna fig. And so they go inside the Smyrna figs where they uh, aren't able to lay their eggs. The, the uh, flowers are at the wrong configuration for them. And so, but they do bring in pollen with them. So they pollinate the flowers inside the fruit, allowing the fruit to develop. Uh, but they actually don't uh, leave any, they're not able to lay eggs and reproduce there. But the fig <clears throat> typically dies inside the fruit. So when you're eating these, you're gonna have, there's gonna be some little tiny, <clears throat> little tiny wasps in there, excuse me, that bug got me. <clears throat> there's a little tiny wasps in your fruit, but it, they kind of dissolve into the, uh, the pulp of the, uh, <clears throat> the figs, so you're not gonna see them. So figs uh, typically produce either one or two crops a year. The first crop is called a breba crop and it develops on the uh, last season's growth. So you see in the picture there, that big fig is a, bre a breba uh, fig that uh, this was at the end of May, <clears throat> early June, when these are ripe. And uh, it's right there, that, that little, the arrow in the middle is showing you where the new growth started. So that fig is right at the end of last year's growth. And then this year, the, the new growth is more green. You can easily tell the difference. And the new fig, and the figs, and the main crop are now are, are growing on the uh, on that new growth. And so not all figs do this. My uh, my Violette de Bordeaux, which is the picture here, does have a breba crop, but the Panache uh, doesn't have a breba crop. Uh, so that's that's one of the big differences. The breba figs are typically a little bit bigger than the main crop figs, but they're not as good usually, not quite as sweet. So figs are very easy to propagate from cuttings. This is normally done in the early spring when the trees are still dormant. You take, you know, you do your regular pruning, you keep the cuttings uh, about a foot long each, and you just put them into a good well-draining soil. Um, you can, you know, if you have rooting hormone, you can, you can put a little rooting hormone at the, at the base of the, of, the, of the cutting and allow it to callus off for about a week before you put it in the potting soil. And then you have Sure, there's at least one node in the soil and at least one node above the soil because the, the node in the soil is where the roots will sprout from and the node above is where the, uh, the leaves will sprout. And uh, these are very, you know, precocious. So sometimes I've had cuttings produce little figs before they do anything else. Uh, you want to take those off. Those are taking energy away from root production, which is the main goal at this point. So when you get a, a one-year-old sapling, you, uh, normally it's just a whip. It may not even have any branches, just have, <clears throat> just have leaves. Uh, <clears throat> in any case, uh, you typically will top it at about one foot. So this is my, my panache. I topped it a little bit more than, I mean, two feet. Top it about two feet. And then plant it in a bit of a mound so it doesn't sink below the soil. If it does happen to have some little branches, then you just cut them off to one or two nodes and, uh, and let it go from there. And so you're doing this usually in the spring. And so six months later, after planting that fig, you can see it's branched out. You can see here where the, uh, the, uh, the cut was made. And, and then there's, you know, there's probably four or five branches that are coming out from along there. And I'll, you know, I'll keep those as scaffold branches. Typically, you actually grow these as an open center plant. Uh, but I, I kept mine as a central leader. This, uh, this branch over here became the new leader. And then I let it grow you know, another year. And then I kind of repeated this process to create uh, two or three tiers of these scaffold branches. Um, and then and that's all it's ever going to have. And after that, it's just I, met, I tip it periodically in the spring to, uh, to encourage new growth and more branching and more fruit production. 
So there's a lot of different uh, varieties of figs to choose from. I got this from Dave Wilson's website, but there's a lot of mail order places that have figs. You're gonna find figs at the big box nurseries. You know, they're, they're very common, very easy to come by and not too expensive. And if you happen to need to grow a fig in a container, this is a fairly new fig that was discovered in uh, 2010. It's actually, it's actually the Violette de Bordeaux, but it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's what you refer to as a uh, mutation from a branch that someone discovered and they cut that off and propagated it because they noticed the branch was growing uh, very compactly. The distance between the leaves was very compact. And so they thought it'd make a really nice, uh, you know, container tree, and it does. And it it produces full-size fruit, just as abundant as the mother Violette de Bordeaux, but in a plant that only gets to maybe six feet tall. So it's, uh, it's really easy to grow in a container. So unfortunately, there are some pests of figs. Uh, you have the, uh, the beetles, the green beetles that go buzzing around and run into you this time of year. They, they, they like all kinds of fruit. Uh, especially if the fruits have already been opened up by like birds or some other, you know, pest. Uh, I mostly have problems with birds here and uh, they're pretty messy eaters. They splatter the fruit with pulp and so I would have to wash everything off. Uh, if you have gophers, you have to control gophers because uh, gophers really prefer fig roots as, a, as one of their favorite foods and they will kill the tree. Uh, so they do have to be controlled. There are some, you know, pests and diseases. But I'm not going to go into that. Instead, I'm going to show you a good reference here. This is a, uh, there's a good presentation by Tom Del Hotel. He's, uh, he's with the California Rare Fruit Growers down in San Diego County. He's an arborist and a fruit tree specialist. And he has a really nice long, uh, about four or five times as many slides as I have presentation on, on edible figs. That was really good. And of course, you can always get more information on all kinds of fruit from the California Rare Fruit Growers website. Sorry, Jeff, I didn't uh, unmute myself. Uh, if, oh. <laughs> if you do me a big favor and go on to your uh, slides and cut and paste your links and throw them up in the chat while we're here, that would be really great. We've got a couple of questions for you. I want to give you a minute to both recover from uh, choking to death. <laughs> yeah, and to, that. um, <clears throat> That's all right. Just watch out for those fig wasps is yeah, all I have to say. I, I don't know how um, they got in here, and, but they did. Yeah, and then get you a moment to, to, as I say, put it up in the chat. People can cut and paste it from there, and they can ask about the links as well on the Ask an LA County Master Gardener. Um, if you have fruit trees of any kind, and figs in particular are there, um, we're going to recommend a book. And you'll notice it's called, very um, cleverly, Home Orchards. If you have fruit trees, there's everything you need to know about any kind of fruit or nut or other kind of tree that you could grow at home, and it's a UCANR publication. Um, it's definitely worth it. I use it all the time. You'll see it's covered in post-it notes. I walk out and say, oh my God, what is my apple doing now? And I go look it up and, and try to figure out how to fix it. All of the different pruning techniques are in here as well. Um, and I see that Jeff has got some of those uh, uh, links going up. Some of the questions that we had, um, there were several questions about pruning, but I think you answered that. There was one specifically about uh, a fig tree that got planted and didn't get pruned at all. And so now it's a fig bush with multiple uh, branches coming up from the base. Do you think they need to do anything about that or, or is it too late to turn well, it back? Well, figs, unlike a lot of fruit trees, are not grafted. And so having things, suckers coming up from the base are not going to be the rootstock, generally speaking. Unless you graft your own tree, I don't think you can find a commercially sold grafted fig. You can graft them yourself. People create multi-grafted trees with figs, just like other types of fruit trees. Uh, but those suck, you know, figs actually naturally will grow with as a bush, a multi-stem plant, unless you prune away the suckers as they come up. So it's really up to you. If you want to have more of a bush, go ahead and let them grow. And if you want a, a central, a, you know, a single trunk tree, then you have to trim them. It's really a personal choice. Cool. Yeah, we have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, now it's got me. Yeah, I'll just send them over here. Yeah. <clears throat> You're in. Excuse me. We have a uh, Bordeaux, uh, the, the Violette Bordeaux, and it uh, is a bush with multiple trunks. And we do try to take some care to trim out those branches that are rubbing on each other because they'll, they'll rub against each other when the wind blows and create a, a wound that can admit uh, uh, damaging things like viruses and, and the like. But uh, yeah, we, we went the bush route because a tree was going to hit the wires if we trained it up straight, so we trained it sideways. Awesome. Um, I'm not sure if I saw any more that 
questions that you didn't actually get to. Oh, that's broccoli. Uh, oh, there was one quick other question. It says, this year I had quite a few conjoined figs. Uh, due to double flowers or something else, or have you ever seen that? Uh, no, I, in fact, in my research, I never ran across it either. So that's really interesting. Normally, you don't need to thin figs, uh, but it doesn't sound like it, you know, if they're conjoined, I, I can't imagine, you know, two figs growing close to each other would actually merge. It would just be, you know, they'd just be pressing against each other. So that's interesting. I, I don't know what causes that. It sounds like you should propagate that and, <laughs> and, 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 and figure out how to market it. Well, there you go. And then you'd have, uh, you know, the, the, the double fig. I, I have that problem with tomatoes sometimes, but with tomatoes, um, it's any, any number of things, including proximity of the flowers, as well as sometimes mites that get in and, and cause a single fruit to look like it's a double, but it's not. So, mm. um, so that might be something like that. Awesome. Well, I have to tell you, this has been a really nutrient dense hour and we're pretty much coming up on our hour here. Um, I am definitely going to go look at my, you know, Amherst uh, soil test results from my, my own school garden and, and reread them. I appreciate it, Judy. And I'm definitely going to go check to see if there are figs to get, because honestly, I like to dry them, even though they're the Bordeaux and not with the nutty seeds in them. They dry up really nicely and they, they store forever once they're dry. Um, so I think it is probably time for us to wrap up. Last call, Master Gardeners, comments, questions? Well, Roger, we, we should also mention uh, that uh, the LA Master Gardeners are about to roll out uh, the fall series of uh, Grow LA Victory Garden classes, which are beginning gardening classes. Uh, they're a four class series. Uh, this time we have to do it online for the most part, although some of our locations are gonna be doing a hybrid version where they do some in-person uh, you know, activities, although it's probably going to be very limited uh, compared to what we normally do. And we'll be announcing that uh, probably within the next two weeks. Uh, Roger has more information on that, I think. And uh, each of us, a few of us here are doing one. I'm, I'm doing one here in Pomona. And, but it's best to pick one that's near you because there will be some, they'll be giving you plants and seeds and things like that as part of the, part of the class. Yeah, that's true. That's excellent. Um, we do do these fall workshops. Um, many of us participate, but there are lots of other presenters who haven't, you haven't seen in the uh, online Master Gardener world who um, do the workshops that are typically about four Saturdays or um, uh, for half a day or slightly more days for fewer amount of hours. Uh, it includes a textbook. Uh, and is actually a, an organized A to Z uh, gardening class. And you can find it under Grow LA Victory Garden. Grow LA Victory Garden. And we'll see if we can get someone to put a link up in the chat for you. Awesome. And they do tend to start in the fall. If you miss the fall series, there's also a spring series because that's a good time to be learning to garden as well. So if your fall is too hectic, hang in uh, and we'll get you into a class in the spring. All right. Our next workshop is September 1st, the first and the third Tuesday. So at September 1st and September 15th, uh, we have some time off to get ready for those in the meantime and let everybody kind of settle into the first few weeks of, of school if you have kids at home. Uh, when we get to September, we hope to talk a little bit about some more things to do with kids in the garden. We are going to have Herb, uh, the orchard team leader, come back and talk to us some more about dealing with fruit trees and the like. And we have a couple of uh, in-depth presentations on growing good soil, which is a thing that you can do all year round, but might help you get prepped for your, your spring garden uh, once we get through the, the depths of the California winter. <laughs> I say that like it's a thing. All right, well, one more time, last call. Excellent. Master Gardeners, if you'd stick around for a moment, everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you in September. Bye now. <laughs>